So, we've just had elections in two of the most important states in the Middle East, Israel and Iran. In two special episodes of In the Zone, I am talking with other members of the team from the Middle East Treaty Organization, METO, about the background, the election, but most importantly, the impacts of those elections on regional peace and security and prospects for the zone. In this podcast, I'm talking with two colleagues and close friends, Imad Kiei and Nima Karami, about Iran. Imad is a director of METO, co-author of A Middle East Free of Weapons of Mass Destruction with the man he calls Uncle, Hussein Massavian, former lead negotiator for Iran under President Khatami. Imad is also half of METO's Roadshow, an Israeli and Iranian talk about the zone. Nima is a former intern of mine at BASIC many years ago and since has set up his own political consultancy. They both carry a wealth of knowledge and experience of the region and are fascinating to listen to. You have a real treat ahead of you. So, Nima, going to turn to you first. Is Iran a democracy? Well, first off, Paul, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. So the short answer is no, I don't think it is. And the problem is that when you look at the past 40 odd years, it feels like the sense of republic as well. Not only it's not a democracy, I don't think it's ever been a democracy, but it's losing its character as a republic as well. So one fascinating thing about the regime at this stage of the game, for me at least, is that the inner circle of the regime, what they call Khodemuniha, is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, so the, if you look at the number of candidates that were disqualified, and some of them like Larry Johnny, uh, they've been close allies to Mr. Khamenei, essentially since he was he became the president of the republic. It just tells you that uh, not only the regime wants democracy, um, because we've been told by a lot of reformists that give us time, stick with us, and you know we can reform from within. But at every election, it feels like that's just not the case and the regime or the core of it or the revolutionary core of it, that's just not what they want. And essentially, when you go through various speeches by Mr. Khamenei or people that are close to his office, um, you realize that they are of the opinion that democracy is a Western ideology, it's something Western, is something aligned to Iran and the Middle Eastern culture by and large or Islamic culture, and therefore it's something to be resisted. And at the same time, they are looking at development uh, globally, especially the rise of China. And I feel like more and more Iran is moving towards a single party sort of a political structure, whereby you have the core of the revolutionary guards and the regime sort of, they decide who can participate in political life and who cannot. And I think it would be fascinating to see how Mr. Raisi would sort of, who will make it to his cabinet. And since he's promised that a sort of justice and economy will be, economic development will be his priorities, it would be interesting to see how he goes about sort of managing, achieving these two things. Will he follow a Chinese path, a very sort of state-led, top-down approach or will he allow for actually like the emergence of um, or revitalization of the public, uh, private sector which i think he won't because to me that would be i mean like then we have to talk about the sectors and does he really want to empower the private sector which is traditionally has been closer to rafsanjani and mr rohan is the sort of the, the pragmatist wing of the government, which are, you know, sidelined. Today they are sidelined and they are going to be sidelined in the next four years. Nima, Nima that's a great, massive, uh, scoping um, introduction to, uh, to the podcast. Um, I wonder if I could turn to you, Imad, and, and ask you how you would characterize the main political divisions currently within the country, uh, given uh, the uh, issues that Nima's outlined. Well, thank you as well, Paul, for the invitation. Um, when it comes to Iran, just quickly on the issue of if Iran is a democracy or not. Well, the official name of Iran is the Islamic Republic of Iran. It has a constitution. It has, you know, different organs of what we will see traditionally in Western democracies or across the world. May that be the office of the president, the cabinet, there's a parliament, there's a judicial system. There's also a, a, a bunch of other councils and, uh, and spheres of influence or power structures that make sure that there is actually some distribution of power. 
And then alongside this more traditional system of governance, there is the Velayatul Fari or the Supreme Leader's Office, and that comes with its own structure. So Iran is actually a hybrid system that incorporates a lot of the characteristics of what we would consider to be part of and parcel of a, a democratic system, elections, as we saw now, there is elections. Yes, the, the candidates are vetted, but there will be arguments from the Iranian side that, well, there's vetting almost in any political system when it comes to elections. In the parliamentary system in the UK, not anybody can run as the prime minister of UK. It is selected by a bunch of people within a party on who it becomes prime minister. Is that democratic? Some people will say that, well, there was very low turnout. Well, more people watched American Idol than voted in the American elections. So does that make the United States a democracy? So the question of democracy or not, I don't think is, is that easy to answer even today in developed traditional democracies. I'm speaking from France and there's a lot of limitations on democracy here in France and seeing it being rolled back. Now, when it comes to political thought or becomes when we're talking about what spectrum of political thinking is present in Iran and how is it represented? Well, in most countries, that will be represented through political parties. We'll say there are leftists, socialists, oriented groups, there is centrists, and there is right-leaning, uh, more uh, conservative groupings of political thought. The same exists in Iran. Now, in the current Iranian system, there is no officially, you can't have political parties. There is no political parties. Yet, there are groupings of like-minded political players who set their own boundaries of what they are, you know, what their platform looks like. And here we can also divide Iranian political field into those things. There are the reformists that Nima touched on, which are saying, well, listen, we can actually reform from within. Let's take our time. Let's open up Iran. Let's engage with the international community. Let's get our economy back on track. Let's have more rights for civil society, for women, and, and, and reform within. There are the conservatives or the principalists who are like, no, the, we are aligned with the original thoughts of the founder of the Iranian Islamic Republic, which is uh, Imam Khomeini, and we will protect the constitution and the connection between the Islamic component and the republic component and keep it within that very tight framework. And then there are others who are uh, disillusioned with the whole system of reform or staying as is with slow changes. And they're saying, we need a complete change. We need to actually, and by the way, I'm not talking about external opposition here. I'm talking about within Iran. There are a growing number of Iranian political players who have been within the Islamic Republic's apparatus of governance and leadership, who are calling for constitutional reform and even possibly the uh, dissolving or watering down the powers of the Supreme Leader and, its, and his office, because actually based on the Constitution, that was supposed to be just an advisory role. And so there are people saying this is not true to the constitution of Iran and we need some changes. Times have changed and we need constitutional reform. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank you, Ima. That's that's so so this is this is the opening uh explanation for where we got to with the election. But I still Nima, I, I come back to you here. Um Ibrahim Raisi, the new president, he comes from more of the conservative element, the um the principalist. But he's still he he got 72% of the popular vote in the first round. And uh, that, that's despite having a number of others, um, including a reformist, standing against him. That suggests to the casual observer that there's a very strong majority within the general public in support of his position and the position of his faction. Uh, what would you say happened there in the election? Well, I think one thing, and I don't have the answer to this, I don't think anyone does, but like if you look at the sort of the Iranian economy and the rule of sort of 
uh, state-owned enterprises and sort of the dominance of the public sector by and large. Uh, one common practice, and this is based on what I've heard from people inside the country, is that you are told both directly and indirectly that you've got to go and take part in elections. It's part of the, like, if you don't, you could sort of uh, endanger your own job security. It's important to have that elect elect sort of electoral stamp on your <clears throat> ID card. So, like, I think, like, when you talk about, like, 70 plus percent, you have to ask yourself, and Emma sort of touch on this, like, let's look at the bigger picture. How many of sort of the elig eligible voters actually sort of participated in this round of election? And the number is small. And But I think this is not very relevant because from the regime regime's perspective, at least at this round, yes, they came out and they tried to encourage people to come out and vote. But essentially, this is not what they really wanted. They just wanted a one day election, get it done, move on. And I think I can't remember who said this, but someone close to the Supreme Leader's office was like, according to the Ayatollah elections, he is for elections, but as long as they last only one day. And I think like this time, like the objective was like, let's have election. Let's make sure someone that we can trust gets into power and we can deal with the rest of it because i think at least from the core of the regime the, the the thinking is that as long as we can ensure a sort of a stable and uninterrupted degree of economic development therefore people can see uh, sort of real improvements in their living standards the iranian public by and large doesn't really care about politics it's very sort of the public is very depoliticized so when you talk about the number, at least my response is that, yes, um, he's definitely popular within his faction. There is no doubt about it. In my opinion, I think Mr. Raisi has the backing of most of the hardliners and conservatives. And I think that could be a blessing for the regime in the long run. It would be interesting to see how that impact Iran's foreign policy, because it would be very difficult to sort of accuse him of being sort of a foreign agent or not really loyal to the regime. So yes, he is popular within his faction, um, but amongst the Iranian public, I don't think it's, the, it's Mr. Raisi only. I think all, almost all the politicians, um, quite like honestly, they don't have the credibility. Like most of the politicians are not popular. And I think one of the problems for reformists was to find a candidate who could galvanize the public. And it just, it's not there. And it's interesting that even Mohammad Khatami has lost his appeal amongst the public. Now, is it a good thing or a bad thing for the regime? I think it's an open question, but honestly, it's more the question of, uh, if not Mr. Raisi, who then? Like, and that's a problem for the system. It's, it's, I think it, it's reached the level that it cannot produce sort of attractive political candidates. And that's something that if I was sitting in Tehran, I, would, I have to be worried about this mm. than whether or not Mr. Raisi is very popular amongst mm. the public. Though I have to say, Nima, it sounds very familiar speaking from London, and uh, I'm sure people in the US would also have uh, similar feelings about uh, about your observation just then in their own country. So, uh, Imad, I wonder if if I could turn to you here about Raisi uh, in particular and uh, his his election. I mean, what 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 does it say about the elite that selected and backed him? What does it say about the Iranian people that voted for him? What do you think it says about the future of the Islamic Republic? And speaking personally, what, what, are, you, what are you hearing from family and friends about their hopes uh, moving forward? Well, um, I think the election of uh, Raisi, or in this case, the selection of Raisi to become the president of Iran, does damage the legitimacy of the Islamic Republic. I think that, uh, yes, it may consolidate power, for those who want to make sure that there is no, um, so that everybody is united in, in their position towards the safeguarding of the Islamic Republic and its institutions and governance. But I think that by really not allowing a diverse uh, uh, rollout of candidates, they have damaged its legitimacy, number one. Uh, number two, I think that the Iranian public is quite political, but they've just become so fatigued by the lack of progress on the demands that they have and their political wishes that they want to see. So I think that it's just um, the apathy that we see in public and the, the fact that so many ballots were just left blank. People did go to vote, but just left it blank. So it's that's what's also unseen in previous elections. 
So people have just given up hope uh, of things getting better. And number three, I think that it's also closes up Iranian society and that small space that was provided for uh, different conversations of uh, political discourses. So that actually narrows it again. You, you cannot step out of the line without being seen as anti-government. So that can cause a lot of ripple effects in terms of those who are part and parcel of society but cannot get any type of their word out. It becomes more of a police state, let's call it that. Uh, finally, I think that like when it comes to the future, in the short run, maybe the fact that the judiciary, the, the parliament, the office of the president and the, um, the cabinet and the whole establishment is within one political thought, the conservatives or the principalists, it may help actually move things forward. So uh, they can make a decision and get it passed and uh, the councils will have agreed to it. And that way, Actually, Raisi has a golden opportunity to do things that no reformist, moderate, former presidents could have done. And that's actually engagement with world powers. Mm -hmm. And so here, there's an irony that could come out of this, that uh, uh, Iran, for the first time, can actually, with one voice, enter into negotiations with world powers, including in maybe a little bit longer term with the United States. And that can be quite interesting when we're seeing it now with the Iran nuclear deal and the broader regional security uh, uh, discussions that will be necessary post JCPOA uh, in terms of discussions on what is happening in the Middle East and Iran's role in different uh, military theaters, may that be in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, and elsewhere, Iraq, across the region. So um, with that, I will just end by saying that like when it comes to my family and friends and personal stories, the economy is really being battered. Uh, there's a little bit of hope of change. And unfortunately, there is very little light at the end of the tunnel. And that will be an increasingly major issue for any government in power. May that be Raisi or, or reformist or otherwise. So these socioeconomic political root reasons that are becoming more exacerbated through sanctions and the dilemmas of the COVID, the pandemic, and other impacts that are coming in, will be a showdown for the government to deal with sooner rather than later. Mm. It's easy, isn't it, to get wrapped up in the political analysis and the the, the very uh, big movements that go on. But when it comes to the personal experience on the ground, uh, the uh, elections like this um, can paper over the cracks of people's everyday desperate experiences as the economy uh, tanks and it gets worse and worse. But uh, but I want to pick up because you were you were talking about foreign policy. I want to pick up and pass the ball back to Nima here, because uh, you know we we saw when President Nixon was uh, was heading up in the U.S. He he attempted to be a madman and uh, a hardliner, and that opened up the possibility of dialogue with China. And I think what we heard there from Imad was the possibility that because Raisi represents some level, at least, of a hardliner, a strong approach, uh, he can't be criticised so easily uh, for being weak uh, in response to uh, Iran's adversaries uh, in the region. I mean, we've seen we've seen signs of rapprochement or attempts at rapprochement in recent months, uh, even from uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Uh, do you do you think Raisi could be a partner in this process? I mean, is this is, is there hope that that with this apparent level of unity, there could be some level of balance and and reaching out in the interests of the stability of Iran in the medium to longer term? I think so. Priority, um, I think, for Mr. Raisi and his cabinet would be regional states. So, exaggerate a bit. Like, if you look at Iran's foreign policy over the past eight years. It's been very much focused on the United States and the nuclear dossier, right? So one of the critic level that Mr. Zarif and I think is a valid critic is that he entirely ignored Iran's neighborhood, especially in the first four years. Iran really didn't have a regional policy. And Mr. Rice, it was interesting during his first press conference, he was like, my priority would be the region. 
so he ruled uh, so essentially he ruled out the prospect of talking to the united states but he was open to the idea of having a conversations with the saudis and other regional players i think when it comes to the united states honestly like if mr raisi and like these group of people cannot make a deal i don't know who can um because i mean like they've got the backing of the entire sort of political system right mm -hmm. and if we can't make a deal with them then it's very difficult to see who we can make a deal with right and um, but i think from the iranian perspective it's up to the united states to prove to the Iranians that, look, it's worth having a relationship with us, okay? And honestly, they have a point here. They're like, we made a deal, you backtracked on it, and now it's your time to sort of deliver. So I think the priority is like to have the sanctions lifted so Iran can have trade on normal terms with other countries in the region and in Europe and in Asia. And once there is a level of trust, then yes, why not? I think he'll be open to having negotiations with the United States. But the priority, as I said, will be uh, Saudi Arabia and regional states and also banking on its strategic pact with China. He mentioned that. He mentioned that a couple of times that relations with, chi <clears throat> with China and Russia are important to us. And if you look at Iran's region, I mean, a lot of interesting developments are taking place nowadays. So in Afghanistan, Iran needs to work with India and China and Russia as the U.S. is moving out, but also Saudi Arabia. I think if there is one country that could sort of uh, exert a level of influence on Taliban, it's Saudi Arabia. But if you look at the GCC itself, I mean, a lot of interesting developments are taking place there. And it feels like at GCC, like now Saudis and Emiratis, I mean, I don't want to exaggerate this, but like they are having disagreements. And that's not a bad thing from the Iranian perspective. And Iranians have always said, even Saudis have to this. So Saudis backed the Iranian stance on the three islands during Mohammad Khatami's presidency. So it feels like uh, in the same way that on the global level, we have big powers talking to each other, like let's set our, set the rules. I think on regional level, uh, it's the Turkey, Iran and Saudi Arabia that feel like they, are, they could come together in order to set the rules of the game. And we have to wait and see. But one thing that would be, I'll just very quickly mention this and then I'll, I'll finish. One thing that would be very interesting is to see like whether the office of the presidency will take charge of Iraq case, Iraq and Syria, or whether it still be, will be the IRGC that sort of sets the policy on these two. So just to follow up on that, Nima, you mentioned the possibilities. I mean, I, I, I almost detect a certain excitement even, as well as a bit scary because things are on the move things are on the move they're highly unpredictable hmm. and uh, this new president coming in there's possibilities it, it could go really badly it could go really it could it could improve what, what would your advice be to the americans and, and to the europeans around the jcpoa when it comes to trying to speed things up or to collaborate with the new president because he's not actually in post until the beginning of august do you think they should try and get the deal before then or is that just off the table or do you think do you think actually there's possibilities here it's not just a simple case of racy bad we need to try and lock him into uh, to something constructive i think they're better advised to wait uh, for mr racy to come into power and i think that's the case because like foreign ministry issued its final report two days ago and essentially it said like we can't make this deal it's up to the next administration but from the for, for the europeans i think that is a good thing because if mr rohani uh, sort of finalized the deal and gets credit for it then the hardliners could sort of criticize it but if you if mr raisi his cabinet his foreign minister signed the deal then i i can't see the parliament criticizing him especially like in his first 100 or 200 days so i think if I'm sitting in DC, if I'm sitting in Brussels, I'll be like, let's wait, let's wait and see what his plans are. And I think that would also give him, an, give them an opportunity to figure out what his vision is for Iran and its role in the region. Imad, I'm going to turn to you with the last question. Uh, one of the reasons why I love being involved in Meto is the eternal optimism that you bring to it. <laughs> I wonder, are you feeling hopeful about Iran's engagement in the zone diplomacy specifically? You know, I am hopeful because um, I believe that uh, even with a Raisi administration, that for Iran to move forward and by Iran moving forward into a better place for its people, because look at where Iran is right now. 
it's the ball, the, the, the gravity of like how things can go really badly have reached a point where like I doubt it can go worse. And if it goes worse, it will be the, the you know, dismantling of the system. So Raisi comes into power with the authorities very uh, conscious of the fact that they need to get the economy back on running. They need to make sure that they can get the domestic situation under control. And by expansion, reach out, as Nima said, these opportunities in Afghanistan with the U.S. pulling out. In Iraq, uh, Iraq is playing a very fascinating role of mediation between different uh, countries, specifically between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The fact that Raisi and his history and having the backing of IRGC, don't forget the Revolutionary Guard, is part and parcel of what is Iran's foreign policy wing and uh, in the region. So I have, of course, my reservations. I'm not necessarily at all a fan of this new president. But what I'm saying is that from a geopolitical perspective, from a national interest perspective, from us being able to move forward. Now again, at least you have one parche, you have one sheet, uh, instead of having a mosaic, you have one sheet of cotton that represents the whole system. If they get it right, they move their country and their own legitimacy and power forward. If they get it wrong, the alternative is something that I don't want to even utter, but many outside of the country and inside the country who are seen as opposition, staunch opposition, may want to then say, we've tried everything, and the only way forward is to bring down the whole system. So this is the litmus test, and um, is one that will be very closely watched by friends and foes of Iran. Great. Thanks, Imad. That's a very sobering point to finish on. And I hope that you found that as interesting as, and informative as I did. Uh, it just uh, falls to me to complete by encouraging you to go to our website, www.wmd-free.me, where you can subscribe to our newsletter, donate money, volunteer to work with us, and find all sorts of fascinating information about the zone and the region. We're also on social media, on Twitter at WMD3ME, and similarly on Facebook and Instagram. You can also find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Cheers, and hope you listen to the next podcast, which is going to be on Israel with our dear friend and colleague Sharon Dolo. Bye for now.